Management of complex forefoot conditions, such as bunions. Bunions would be one of the more, more um, common conditions that I see as a podiatric surgeon. Uh, and so I wanted to give you a bit of an idea of sort of what I'm looking at um, and how I sort of approach my treatment of bunions uh, as well. So we'll go through a little bit on the description and classification systems, our imaging um, and preferences around that, as well as conservative management, although I'm sure we uh, all know a bit, about, um, bit more about that. Um, I'll breeze through that, uh, I think. Um, when to treat surgically, um, we'll have a bit of a chat, and then the surgical management as well. Um, but to give you a bit of an idea, what, what's a bunion? Bunions we know as hallux valgus or hallux adductor valgus, um, but is more commonly termed a bunion. Um, the valgus deformation is of that great toe, the hallux. Um, the varus deformation of the first metatarsal, um, so that increases the intermetatarsal angle that we uh, then look at on x-ray. Um, we find that we get that medial eminence prominence of the first metatarsal bone. Um, and that can be due to a little bit of further calcification, but is actually um, due to that varus deformation of the first metatarsal as it um, goes through to our uh, midpoint. Um, and we sometimes find that there's a little bit of um, adjacent bursitis to that medial eminence. Um, and quite often a Joplin's neuroma as well, um, which is a neuroma of that plantar digital nerve. And uh, we also find the pronation of the great toe. It should be stressed, um, as you all know, that this is not merely a pathology of the first ray, but of the entire foot. So unless we are targeting everything, it's not going to be as effective um, as what it could be. So we need to make sure that we're looking at the entire foot, otherwise we could lead to metatarsalgia and uh, further symptomatic concerns. The simple bunion classification, as we've all seen, is that mild, moderate and severe. Um, for myself as a surgeon, this doesn't cater for everything that I need and is very two-dimensional in approach. And so I wanted to introduce a new classification system and go through it really quickly to give you a bit of a further understanding about the biomechanics, um, but also what I'm looking at from a radiographic X-ray point of view too. Uh, so an article by Hatch um, uh, and colleagues um, from 2019 um, was looking at the differences uh, between this. And this is very important for a surgical point of view as management because we're now introducing the frontal plane and what's happening to the first metatarsal in the sesamoid complex um, within that frontal plane that we find uh, increases, uh, when it's not managed, increases the rate of um, dissatisfaction due to recurrence. Um, and so there's a few different uh, points there um, and also these treatment recommendations as well. Um, which really guide us as to what would be the most appropriate procedure for what stage of bunion that we're looking at. When we are looking at the class one, we're really looking at that um, hallux valgus on our DP, um, but with no rotation um, observed on the actual view. And you can see our sesamoid sitting in a really nice position still under our hallux um, within the apparatus. When we move to our 2A class, we're seeing the inversion of the first metatarsal and the sesamoid is still within the groove um, of the crista, the crista of the first metatarsal being this groove here and our medial and lateral sesamoid still being in position. Moving forward from that, we start to see um, some subluxation of the sesamoids and within that sesamoid complex, which is then starting to look at that frontal plane motion um, and deformity that we may need to uh, what we will need to correct when we're looking at procedures. Moving to our class three, we then bring in metatarsus adductus, which is quite common. Um, I'm sure we've all seen uh, quite a lot of metatarsus adductus. And this changes very much how we have to potentially undertake the procedure, because instead of that intermetatarsal angle being increased, it's likely that that intermetatarsal angle of two, three is actually influencing what we're looking at within intermetatarsal angle of one, two. Uh, we then move on to our class four where we're now starting to see a lot of arthrosis, arthritis um, within that sesamoid complex, um, adjoining you know, an uh, enlarged uh, bunion deformity as we typically see. 
to appreciate these um, views or this pathology um, being the bunion, we really need to get a, the, the right image in. And so I really appreciate for those that have already sent referrals through, um, a lot of the time we are able to organise imaging before patients uh, can get through. And that's a lot of the time managed through your, uh, you as podiatrists, as physios, but also through GPs as well. And so we like to try and call ahead where possible um, to try and uh, go, go through and um, provide patients um, the ability to get a thorough opinion as soon as they're reviewing. Uh, so we also then look at ultrasound at times. Uh, I've actually got clinic in clinic ultrasound. Um, I take my own ultrasound machine around, which allows me to you know, double check, okay, how much bursitis we're looking at. Is there a Joplin's neuroma? Is there any ganglions uh, that are affecting this? As well as getting a, a greater idea of what the um, bony anatomy is uh, in that area. So I find this fantastic. Um, and a little known fact is that ultrasound is absolutely incredible for um, stress fractures and finding uh, stress fractures uh, or diagnosing them, I should say. And so there's a lot of that ultrasound uh, type of information that I also wanna start passing on to you guys within clinic so that you can start you know, looking at potentially purchasing ultrasound um, so that we can start undertaking that. And I'll have a bit of a chat about that towards the end of today, uh, this evening as well. Conservative management with bunions. I think you're all doing it, okay? Orthotic splinting, um, yeah, each to their own, not as effective and um, is generally activity related. Exercise and physiotherapy. We're really looking at that intrinsic muscle strengthening. Again, looking at that broad biomechanical correction here. A corticosteroid injection can resolve some of that pain. It's my preference not to look at that if we are wanting to go to surgery because that's going to potentially cause concerns with our bone healing um, if we were to go to surgery uh, soon after. The biggest thing for me, and you'll see that I reiterated a lot um, through a lot of my training and um, uh, this evening as well, uh, I think reassurance and patient education is really what we're there for. Um, being a profession where we're you know, very much hands-on and able to have that conversation um, a lot more than other practitioners, means that we're able to deliver, you know, really thorough information and explanation uh, to augment what we're doing physically to help our patients. So I think, you know, we're doing that quite well um, within allied health generally um, and podiatry, physiotherapy quite strong as well. Most importantly is to get an idea of when to refer for surgery. As I mentioned, um, and you'll start seeing me being quite repetitive, patient education is paramount. Um, inform them enough to be able to make that decision um, and let them make that decision. Uh, if you don't know everything about um, you know, the procedure, that's fine. Say, this is what we're looking at. Um, this is how it's generally undertaken. But you know, I think you should go for an opinion. Um, I've, I've put down the bottom, there's no strings attached. Patients come to me opinion for an opinion. If I think surgery is appropriate, then I'll say, let's go for surgery. If I think there's something else that you may be able to do within your clinic, I'll say, yeah, what I'd like to do is refer back to um, your podiatrist, your physiotherapist, um, let's look at orthotics or let's look at intrinsic strengthening, let's look at this. I don't think you quite need um, surgery at this stage and I think we'd let, we might exhaust some more conservative before we look at that. In saying that, molder deformity has greater success and if there's a very strong um, you know, uh, level of requ um, requirement um, due to pain or uh, quite a large hereditary uh, component, then it may be that the patient's at a stage of life where they can benefit more from having a procedure undertaken whilst it's mild than waiting longer until there's other health concerns or uh, a greater deformity that we need to manage. Um, in saying this, if there's no pain, it's not always required. And we might just look at a, a watch and see approach. Uh, the last thing I wanna do is um, you know, undertake surgery on a patient uh, and they have 90% um, a great outcome, but that last 10% is that they've got one out of 10 pain that wasn't there before. And to me, that's, that's not a great outcome because we've gone from no pain to having some pain. And so we just wanna look at our options around that and whether, um, you know, managing that patient conservatively for longer is a better option. 
in saying that larger deformity usually does require a fusion or an arthrodesis and there's less opportunity for minimal incision surgery to be successful um, if at all able to be undertaken when it is larger deformity. Um, consider trialing conservative um, and if no resolution discuss the surgery further um, and the patient's um, you know, pros and cons so that they can make that informed decision. Getting to the stuff that I uh, quite enjoy. Uh, the distal, uh, so surgical management is direct or indirect um, from uh, where I look. So when we look at bunion procedures in particular, um, we're looking at generally distal and proximal metatarsal procedures um, and hallux procedures. We then look into whether we're going to undertake that via minimal incision bunion correction or open bunion correction. Um, and then the indirect side again looks at the, um, uh, the EOTs via Hypercure, which I'll go through um, to give you a bit of a further idea of what we're managing there or how we're managing. So distal metatarsal procedures. So we're looking at that distal aspect of the metatarsal right here. And um, what we're looking at in this image is a um, arthrodesis or fusion plate. Uh, and that's obviously a finite procedure and left for quite significant or severe um, uh, deformity. Where possible, we try to avoid that. Um, don't be too worried about different fixation things, um, but you know we're looking at different screws, plates, or K wires or steel wires um, to enable uh, fusion a lot of the time. But it's not always necessary that we do need to have uh, fixation. Uh, for instance, this is one of the Isham um, minimally invasive osteotomies, and this is actually a floating osteotomy, and we use a lot of uh, taping to enable that correction of deformity uh, after doing a minimal incision uh, osteotomy. The most common uh, bunion procedure is an Austin or Chevron osteotomy, uh, this is where we cut through in a, a chevron or V style, slide this across laterally, and then generally we'll fixate it with one screw, um, potentially two if it's a little bit unstable or poor bone density. Uh, this is a procedure that everyone does quite often. When we look for more severe deformity or for some surgeons, they like doing the scarf osteotomy, um, just as whether there's mild, moderate or severe deformity, it's quite effective and quite adaptable depending on how much deformity there is. And basically it is that Z cut through the full length of the metatarsal and generally fixated with a two screw uh, complex. Uh, again, we remove that medial eminence, similar for the Austin osteotomy, which allows us to reduce that intermetatarsal angle, the prominence, uh, and correct that bunion deformity in a few different planes. When we look at proximal metatarsal procedures, um, generally we're looking at that first metatarsal cuneiform fusion and an opening base wedge osteotomy. When we're looking at that metatarsal cuneiform fusion, we're really looking at that frontal plane um, correction that we may need. And so a lot of surgeons, particularly those in America I'm finding and um, some parts of Europe, are actually looking at correcting that metatarsal into um, you know, uh, the corrected neutral position, um, bringing those sesamoids back under and um, into a corrected position under that first metatarsal um, phalangeal joint, which is really helping to, again, uh, increase that biomechanical efficiency whilst also decreasing the bunion deformity. One of my um, preferred um, base procedures is this opening base wedge osteotomy. Basically, it's a cut all but a mil or two mils through to the other side of the metatarsal. And this plate's actually got a V um, just in this area here to fit within there at a, um, you know, a, a set um, gap, which allows us to know how much we're going to be closing that metatarsal uh, or intermetatarsal angle. Um, there are quite a number of different procedures for bunions. Uh, these are two of my proximal procedures that I, um, I like a lot more and without going into the hundred or so that we've got available. Again, hallux procedures, uh, it's not uncommon, but uh, it is less seen that we've got a, a purely um, deformity, pure deformity of the hallux. 
but a lot of the time we'll definitely undertake an ache and osteotomy as part of our um, proximal or distal procedures that we're looking at. Uh, and these sort of involve just taking a wedge of bone out and then closing that down, um, generally with either a screw or a staple. Um, we've also got the interphalangeal joint fusions for those that have got quite a lot of joint destruction within the interphalangeal joint. You can see these ones are, are you know, are just a few different ways that we can fixate that. Minimal incision bunion correction. So this is a couple of images um, from the fluoroscopy. So this is what I'm seeing um, within procedures that we're looking at, you know, a pre-operative and a post-operative um, bunion correction. This is a Austin osteotomy via minimal incision along with an Aiken osteotomy. And both are fixated down uh, with a 2.4 mil screw um, that we call cannulated. So it's able to have a wire guiding um, that screw into the right place that we then uh, watch under fluoroscopy to make sure that that's um, capturing the bone and um, maintaining uh, the position that we're wanting to look at. Again, um, over here, this is what we're generally using to take off the medial eminence. We're then making the osteotomy through here. We're doing an adductor release through this one and putting in our fixational screw through uh, this incision here. We're looking at four, maybe five incisions at most, um, which patients love and it's generally healed um, you know, by that two weeks. Uh, generally a lot less edema, bruising and pain. Um, again, some practitioners may argue that, um, but in, um, you know, I, I find that that's quite um, an effective option for most patients. Sometimes we can't escape open bunion correction. And uh, in this instance, this is quite a large bunion that was corrected via um, an open approach. And uh, what we're looking at obviously is dislocation through the MTBJs um, uh, and subluxation through the first, quite a large bunion deformity uh, and clawing of the toes. When we then look through here, we've got everything in a lot nicer position. Um, we've used one of our different types of internal fixation devices here, rather than a K wire through the end of the toe. Uh, and this patient was quite happy with her result uh, when we um, uh, got through to sort of that three month post-op um, review. Sorry for the gory, but you uh, should have expected it at some point. This is um, a patient that absolutely loved their outcome. This one in the middle is actually uh, this right one at the same time. And this is a, um, uh, you know, a quite a um, complex rheumatoid foot reconstruction. And as we all know, those with rheumatoid arthritis can get quite a lot of forefoot deformity. In these cases, sometimes we need to be quite aggressive um, and unfortunately, we're unable to keep a lot of her joint due to her arthritis. And so we've opted for an arthroplasty where we've taken parts of the bone out um, of metatarsals and of phalanxes. This is less often required. Um, and this patient had um, you know, quite a lot of different fixation in that was removed after a period of um, uh, extended period of eight weeks and um, due to concerns with healing and uh, maintaining that fixation point. And um, we also are able to undertake, uh, only, un uh, only able to undertake a um, fusion of the first MTBJ um, through an open plate fixation. And you can see that we've also shortened some of the metatarsals in this um, patient to allow those uh, clawed toes to be corrected as well. Um, I mentioned it a few times. Uh, this is another one of my favorite procedures just because of how effective we can find that it is. Um, the extra osseous talotarsal stabilization uh, is an implant uh, like a screw that allows us to prevent hyperpronation, basically. And I know we're moving away from saying hyperpronation, but really we're acting within that subtalar joint um, to allow a, a more normal, natural uh, position to be attained. And I'm going to show a video later this evening on how that sort of works as well. From a bunion perspective, we can decrease um, that intermetatarsal angle um, by a mean of 5.7 degrees. And in those that have got a flat foot um, with secondary bunion um, deformity, this is quite an um, effective option to be able to undertake. 
generally takes less than half an hour uh, and is undertaken through a minimal incision um, into the sinus tarsi. 